Well, we're made out of dirt, but they're all made out of hardened sugar, I think. So. <laughs> every, every Sunday between services, I have to go put my paper back in order, and this is the first time I've forgotten to do that. So give me a second. There we go. You don't want it in backwards order. Dear friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's start with an admission. On Tuesday, during our weekly Bible study, I was wrong. I thought I'd get one gasp. (laughs) It doesn't happen very often, and I know I admit it less often still, but this week I was wrong. I claimed that within us, within each human, there is a struggle, and I was right about that, but I was wrong about what the struggle is. I realized that when I, I realized this, When I thought of an old saying that's so true, is logic so sound that it's impossible to argue with. God made dirt, and dirt don't hurt. As I noted earlier, we're taking a walk through the Old Testament this fall, and for the first four weeks, we'll explore, as John noted, a common theme, names. Because in the Bible, names are important. They say something about the one being named, that is us, and they say something about the one doing the naming, that is God. And the first name in the Bible, well, it isn't actually a name at all. It's just a word, actually, and it becomes a name later, Adam. It just means human or man in some situations, but it comes from the word for ground or earth, which in Hebrew is Adama. Adam from Adama, humans from hummus, earthlings from the earth, we are people of dirt. Which, of course, gets right to the story. God shaping and molding a human from dirt, like a potter with clay, and then, ever so delicately and yet with determination and purpose, breathing into the human and in doing so, creating life. And Adam is not the story of one guy some thousands of years ago. Adam is the story of all of us. All of us earthlings, people of dirt, with God's breath animating us. And here's where we get the struggle, or at least here's where I thought we get the struggle. The struggle between our earthly nature and that breath of God living in us. The struggle between the dirt we are made of and the divine spark we sometimes feel within. We often want to hide that earthly part of us, our mortality, our bodies, our weaknesses and limits, our tears and shouts and laughs and exhaustion and flesh, our inextricable tie to the earth. Our bodies seem to be not just a box that holds the spirit and breath of God, but sometimes more a prison, keeping that spirit from truly living to its full potential, to use an Oprah term. If only we could free ourselves. If only we could fully live as spirit. Ah, these bodies. You can't live with them and you can't live without them. That's the struggle. And this struggle, I'm not just making it all up. It's everywhere. We Christians borrowed from the Romans this idea of a dichotomy. The idea that there is a true us, it's our spirit or our soul, and then there's our lowly bodies. It's part of how we all just assume the world is, right? Right? Just think about how we describe death sometimes as escaping, as the spirit escaping the body. Or think about how we revere those who seem to transcend the body or this world. Or think of the word transcend. In fact, throughout the history of the church, there has often been so much frustration with the mortal, fleeting, fleshy things of this world. It's why certain types of monasticism were held up high. It's why we look up to those who pray all day and don't dirty themselves by getting mixed up in this world. It's why we imagine the spirit to be the place of holiness and the body, the world, the place of sin. We feel like the very things that make us human are the worst parts about us. Our desires and emotions and limits, we long to overcome these. I know I do. I long to be above the fray of this world, to be spiritual, lost in prayer, to be one of those in this world but not of this world type of people. That's the struggle. And it's everywhere. Almost everywhere. (laughs) There's one place I just can't seem to find it. And that's in Genesis chapter 2. Actually, you could argue that it's not in most of the Bible, but especially Genesis chapter 2. 
In this story of God putting hands in dirt and shaping and molding a human, this magnificent story that says so much, nowhere does it say that the dirt God used was bad or that we were bad for being made of dirt. Nowhere does it say God used pathetic dirt or inferior dirt or even mere dirt. The story, it seems, does not share our downward glance at being earthlings, humans. The story does not endorse this struggle. I was wrong. (gasps) Which means if there is a struggle, it's got to be something else. And I believe there is a struggle. But it isn't a struggle between our spiritual and earthly natures. It's a struggle against the perception of that earthly nature. It's a struggle to accept that being earthlings, humans, Adam from Adama, it's a struggle to accept that God made us people of dirt and that's exactly who we're supposed to be. That old spirit-body dichotomy doesn't define the struggle. Rather, the struggle is that we have this darn dichotomy in the first place. Don't believe me? Think about all the ways our rebellion against who God, is, who God made us to be. Think about all the ways that impacts us in this world. You could start with our view of eternal life and heaven. We too often think heaven is this place we go to when we die, when we're free from this shell of a body. But in the Bible, heaven and eternal life don't wait for us. They come to us right here and now. Life with God starts now, each and every day anew, here among these bodies in this world. Sure, it's imperfect. Sure, the suffering and doubt of this world battle against that true life every day, but you can't blame the dirt for that. And this view that dirt is dirty, that we are dirty for being just human, this also gives us really messed up views of our own bodies, which we nip and tuck and cover in makeup. It gives us even worse perceptions of sex and getting old. The shame we lay on ourselves because of how our bodies fatten and droop and desire and wrinkle Well, let's just say we could save a whole lot of money if we accepted that these bodies were exactly the way God intended us to be. And it gets worse. For 2,000 years, many Christians viewed all things earthly as bad, and that led to the assumption that the earth itself was bad, or at least not much of a concern of God's anymore. So So as we discovered that we could really harm the planet, many Christians responded simply with, eh, what's the big deal? It's just the earth. The result was a mindset that saw our world as merely a warehouse of resources for us to use up as we waited for Jesus to save us from this awful place. Thank God we're finally finding the minority voice throughout our history that said, hold on. You know, God made this world and called it good. Perhaps God still cares about it. And on and on and on I could go. Really, it's just awful that we've come to think that being of this world, that humanness itself is a problem, perhaps even the problem. The guilt and shame we thrust on ourselves, the resulting disconnection from the earth and from each other, which is the only thing God calls not good in the story, by the way. The way we then sequester God and life with God to some foreign time and place called heaven, lest God get caught up in all this dirt, It all leads us to having not just a pretty low view of ourselves, but also of what good we're capable of and what God might be able to do through us. When you start from a place where we're inferior, we're dirty just because of who we are, it limits your imagination. And imagination might be what we need most right now. So if our true struggle isn't against this negative, sorry, if our true struggle is against this negative view of our humanness, then perhaps the remedy is to read this story again and see that this, these bodies, this life we have, it's all a gift. This divine breath infused into a pile of dirt, this pile of dirt with weaknesses and limitations, these piles of dirt which get sad and fall too quickly in love and too slowly out of anger, these piles which bend and break and really need one another just to survive, need the earth to survive, these piles of dirt are exactly what God had in mind, exactly what God intended, exactly what God loves. These are good. Of course, there are things that are not good. I know that. 
In our story, the not good is when we are alone. In the next chapter of Genesis, the not good is when we don't trust God, including not trusting the way God made us. After eating the fruit, Adam and Eve realize they are naked, and so they hide. And then God says, who told you that you were naked? As if to say, who told you that you are bad the way I made you? You are good. There is bad in this world, in us, but it's not the dirt. Which brings me to our gospel reading. You know, earlier, when I was, before I knew I was wrong, I originally thought this little part from Mark was the perfect companion to our Genesis reading because it shows the depth God goes to in order to love us. I mean, Jesus heals a man with leprosy by reaching out and touching him, a risky thing to do in that day. That's going to a depth to love us. I wasn't wrong about that. I'm still right on occasion. (laughs) But there's also something else here in this story. Jesus doesn't heal the man by turning him into some sort of bodiless, spiritual being. He just heals the leprosy. Like he heals blindness and hunger and broken legs and broken faith. The leprous man is sick and therefore also cut off from his community. Those both need to be healed. But being a human, there's nothing wrong with that. Jesus was a human. A fact so upsetting that many stuck in that spirit body dichotomy, that, uh, sorry, many stuck in that dichotomy, uh, sorry, a fact so upsetting that to many stuck in that spirit body dichotomy, that whole group of early Christians, they tried to claim that Jesus wasn't human, which is why stories of him crying and eating and sleeping and bleeding and dying are so important to prove that he was human. Sometimes we think Jesus became a human in order to help us overcome humanity, but that's not in the Bible either. I think it's funny how we take a book as thick as the Bible and keep adding to it. Maybe Jesus became a human in part to help us see that our humanity isn't the problem, but rather trusting God, trusting God to love us, trusting in God's gifts of mercy and faith and life, yes, even this life. Being human was never our problem. Accepting our humanity, well, that's a struggle. To close, I'll answer the question from my wisest critic. So what? So what? We're all human, earthlings, people of dirt. So what are we supposed to do with that? Well, for starters, live. Stop trying with all your might to transcend this life or distract yourself from this life or find God outside of this life. Live. Live with your eyes open for God. Live expecting God to work through your weak and flawed body. Live connected to one another, for it is not good for us to be alone. Live trusting that you have been given this fantastic gift, this once-in-a-lifetime gift called life. So live it. Live trusting that God made dirt and dirt don't hurt. Amen. Let's stand and sing together number 679.